Welcome back. In this video, we are going to finish chapter 2. And we'll cover section 2.3 about functions of several variables and functions with several components. And we shall prove, by the way, uh, two more uh, rules of differentiation, mainly the product rule and the quotient rule. Okay. So, the first topic is that we have to, we'll generalize <coughs> a very elementary fact. If you have a function with m components of real variables, so, then it's easy to prove that f is differentiable at a point a, if and only if all its components are differentiable at a. And in this case, the derivative it's just the, vec the vector whose, deriv whose components are the derivatives of each component. So this is almost trivial, actually. So now we'll extend this to the case where instead of R, we have a ordered space, and instead of Rm, we have a product of norm spaces. Okay? So more generally, if we have a function defined on an open subset of a norm space E that takes values in a product of norm spaces. So since this is a product, then f of x is actually a vector with m components where each component is an fi. So we denote the components by f1, f2, fm. Okay. So then f is differentiable at the point A in new if and only if all its components are differentiable at A. And in this case, the Frechet derivative uh, evaluated at H is just the vector of derivatives. Okay, so, so if you like, we can write this in this way. But now note that F prime of A is a linear bounded operator and each F K prime of A is a linear bounded operator. So we can put all these linear bounded operators into one vector or one uh, row matrix, if you like. This is this notation is very convenient. <clears throat> so when I apply an increment h, this means that I get a vector in the product of f i. Okay. So this is now really a vector of linear bounded operators. Very convenient notation. Okay. This is pretty straightforward, but you have to introduce some notation, two notation actually, uh, the projections on onto the kth factor, pk, so that to each vector having m component, we com uh, we associate the kth component, okay, this pk, and we have to introduce on also the, the natural injection, there are m injections actually, if you have M uh, norm spaces. So, so to each variable x in F k, we associate the vector in the product, the element in the product whose kth component is x, and the remaining components are zero. Okay. So this is actually this permits to identify F k with a subset of the product. Okay. So. Now, it's very easy to check that PK and UK are linear bounded maps on their domain. Of course, here we, we can equip the product space with the maximum norm or any other equivalent norm, if you like. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't change the differentiability, the Frechet differentiability. Okay? <clears throat> so, all these, so PK and UK are linear bounded maps. And therefore, according to Proposition 2.5, the derivative of UK at any point X is just UK, so it doesn't depend on X, it's constant. And same thing for PK prime, okay? And now by definition, PI of F is just the ith component. So we have these important relations, FI is PI of F, and when we sum uh, ui of fi over all i, we get f. Okay. So this, if you put here, for example, uh, any any term. Okay. If you put uh, 
xi or xk here and you do the summation you'll get the vector x <coughs> okay so in particular if you put instead of x fk of x and you do the summation you get f1 of x f2 of k, x fm of, FM of x so this is an important relation you can write it actually in the way um <coughs> So you can instead of f, you can put anything. Actually, you can put any vector here. Okay, so now we have any, to prove any equivalence here. So if f is differentiable, this relation, this first relation, f i equal p i of f, uh, dictates that each component is differentiable because it's a comp but this is the chain rule by the chain rule. And fi prime at a is just the composition of the two derivatives, which is just pi of f prime of i. This is one way. The second way, if each fi is differentiable, since ui is differentiable, then again, by the chain rule, this is differentiable. The sum of differentiable is differentiable. So this, so we have equivalence, actually. And this relation, actually, if, uh, is just equivalent to saying that so I, if I just apply h, I get f, f i prime at a evaluated at h is just the ith component of f prime of h. So, and this is actually, this precisely can be written as, so I can write this vector in the product <coughs> as a vector whose, so the first component is in f1, the second component is in capital F2, and the last component is in capital F. Okay. So, and I said that the converse follows from the second relation. Okay. And the corollary. So, under the same assumptions, f is C1, if and only if all its components are C1. Okay. Because continuity is conserved, if you like. So, a function is continuous if and only if all its components are continuous, as you know from topology. So, okay. So as a corollary of this uh, simple but important fact is a generalization of the product formula from calculus. The derivative of fg is f prime g plus fg prime. But in order to generalize this to the context of Banach spaces or normal spaces, we have to define an analog of a product. So in general, an analog of a product is really a linear bounded map now it's not not should yeah, it's not necessarily uh, symmetric. If it's symmetric, it's fine. If it's not symmetric, it's okay. So, so in particular, it happens if I have a, a dot product actually. So, so, if you have two functions f and g defined on the same subset U of a normal space E, and each one taking value in a different normal space. So f small f takes values in capital F one and small g takes values in capital F2, they could be equal. And you have a linear bounded, a bilinear bounded map from F1 times F2 into a third Banach space or norm space G. We note that we don't need the completeness assumption. So all the concepts are hold in an arbitrary norm space. Okay, so if I not, so if I compose now L with F and G, I get a new map F, and if both F and G are differentiable at A, then L of FG, that I denote by capital F, is also differentiable at A, and its derivative at H is given by this formula, which is just the analog of this. So this is F prom H by G at A. So here I have a product. So this is the... Um, this is the product of f prime h g of a plus the same thing f of a g prime a of h okay now note that f prime a of h is an element in f1 whereas f prime of a is a bilinear is a linear continuous map okay so this is an element in capital f1 this is an element in capital in capital f2 here capital f1 capital f2 okay so this is a corollary of the previous proposition as well as the chain rule. So we introduced a new function with components small f and small g. Okay. 
Okay, so this is now a map from U to capital F1 times capital F2. So if F and G, small f and small g are differentiable at A, then according to the previous proposition, capital Phi is differentiable, and its derivative is just the vector with, uh, whose components are the derivative. So therefore, now we can write capital F as composition between the bilinear map L and Phi, right? So by the chain rule, so L, of course, is differentiable. We know that C1, we know that. And you have a formula for its derivative. So capital F prime at A evaluated at H is the derivative of capital L evaluated at phi A. And everything is evaluated at phi prime times H. So this is just the chain rule. But L prime is actually what? L prime of f a g a evaluated at f prime h g prime h so so we just go back to uh, section 2.1 we had here x1 x2 and here h1 h2 and the derivative was just actually l of h1 x2 plus l of x1 h2 so this is just by and that's it so this is the extension to above the product rule to the context of Norm spaces. Okay. Another corollary of so <clears throat> so and now if f and g are c1 or uh, then their product is also c1 because just composition of smooth maps. Now for the quotient to generalize the derivative of a quotient that you know uh, we have to assume that. Uh, we cannot, in general, we cannot divide a vector by a vector in a known space. So we have to assume that f and g take uh, values in R with g non-zero. Okay. So, but in order to, to uh, extend the derivative of a quotient, we need first a lemma. So, if you consider the function just of two variables, s t, which is just the first uh, comp uh, argument over the second argument, so the second argument should be different from zero. So this is just a function of two variables. And as you know, uh, it has partial derivatives of all orders, actually. And we shall prove, or maybe you already know, that if a function has continuous partial derivatives, then it is c1. Uh, we will prove this in the next chapter. We don't know that yet. But if you know this, then uh, according to what we said, the derivative, the Frechet derivative of capital F at the point ST evaluated at HK is just the partial derivative times the first increment plus the second partial derivative times the second increment. So <coughs> therefore, this is the formula for the Frechet derivative. It's linear in h in the cap in the couple h h k, okay, but not linear in s and t. Now, if you don't know this result, you can prove this by going back to the definition, but it's a little bit it to require some work. So, when you evaluate the difference between f of s plus h t plus k minus f of s t minus this linear part you will get this remainder. So you get terms of the form hk, k square, and k. So you see that the hk, of course, and k square is something of the form, of course, it's a small o of hk. It's a big o of hk, actually, squared. There's just a small point here uh, that you have to work a little bit, that you have, if k is small enough, then 1 over t plus k in absolute value, because you have to take the absolute value at the end, is bigger than 1 over absolute t minus absolute k. And this can be actually made less than 1 over t over 2. Okay, so you have, there's some non-trivial point here. But if you like, you can prove that this remainder is a big O of the norm of hk squared. Okay which is, of course, a small o of hk. And this is the direct proof that capital F is 
uh, fresh shade differentiable and its derivative is given by this formula. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so as a corollary now, I can prove the an extension of the quotient rule. Uh, the quotient rule. So here we have two functions f and g defined on an open subset of a normal space, but they take value in R with g does, where g doesn't vanish because we'll divide by g. So f of x and g of x. X is an element in a normal space, but its value is a number. Okay, so if f and g are differentiable at a point A, then their quotient is differentiable at A, and the derivative of the quotient is given by this familiar formula. But now here, g of A is a real number. f prime A is not a real number. f prime A is the real element in the dual of E. So when, when I apply it to an increment h, I get real number. So g A real number, f prime A h real number, same thing here. So this is a ratio of two real numbers. And this is just actually a consequence of uh, the previous lemma, the chain rule, and uh, the derivative of uh, a function with several components. Okay? So I can write, uh, keeping the same notation, if capital F of ST denotes S over T, then F over G is just capital F composed with fg, which is what was denoted by phi. And therefore, by the chain rule, uh, f over g is differentiable, and its derivative is given by this formula. So the derivative of capital F evaluated at the derivative of fg, which is the vector of its component derivative. So, so I just apply the previous lemma. What is the derivative, the Frechet derivative of f capital F? So it's just 1 over the second argument times the first component here, plus or minus the first argument over the second argument squared times the second argument. So now real number, real number, real, everything is real actually. So but just to but f prime a, a is not a number. Okay, but when when evaluated at h, it, it gives me a real number. So we just reduce to the same denominator and get the familiar formula G A F prime A H minus F A G prime H, everything divided by G of A squared, which is a real number. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, according to what we said, if F and G are C1, then the ratio is C1 because as a composition of, so continuity of the derivative follows from continuity of uh, the comp uh, of the comp uh, of composition of maps. Okay, and now the last topic is uh, <clears throat> about functions with several variables or functions defined on a subset of a product of norm spaces. Okay, so as you expect, the partial derivative. So we have actually here a function of n variables. The partial derivative, if it exists, of f at the point A is by definition the derivative of this partial map obtained by fixing all variables except the ith one. And I differentiate this at the point AI. Okay, this is the definition of the partial derivative if it exists. So and <clears throat> When it exists, it's denoted by one of these symbols, so del f over del xi, or partial f over partial xi uh, at a, or f, x, f sub xi prime at a, or even we can drop the prime. We can also write capital D sub i f at a, or partial i f a. So you use the notation that you like. So when they exist, actually, these are by definition, linear, linear bounded maps from EI, capital EI, to F. <clears throat> okay. And now we need a useful notation because the, the target now, the theorem that we have will prove is that if F is differentiable at A, then it has partial derivatives with respect to all variables. But of course, the converse is not true as you know. 
<coughs> but to prove this, we will have to introduce uh, this notation. So, if lambda i denotes the following map, so we fix a point i. So in this discussion, a is fixed, okay? And if instead of small a i we put x, we get a function of one variable. Okay? So this is just lambda i of x. Why do I need that? Because this partial map in this case is just uh, <clears throat> f composed with lambda i. Okay. So by definition, uh, the partial derivative of f at x i is by definition the derivative of this partial map evaluated at the point a i. So this is just a useful notation. Okay, and now I go, I come to the uh, main result, which states that if f is Frechet differentiable at a point a, then it has partial derivatives with respect to all its variables at the point a. And if h is an element in the product, in the source space, with components h1, hn, then f prime evaluated at h is can be written as this uh, in this way it's a dot product actually if you like between the gradient and h if you like <coughs> now why this is so because we can write if you use the same notation that we introduced earlier but instead but here we are working <coughs> From EI to the product of EIs. Uh, so UI of X is defined to be the factor whose components are zero except at the ith place I have X. Okay, so this is the canonical injection from EI to the product. And what is the relation between lambda I and UI? Very easy. Lambda I by definition is given by this formula. So here a is fixed in this discussion. If in the ith component I write a i plus x minus a i, and then I can I just split the two into two vectors. So I get uh, the vector whose components are a1, a n, which is just a, plus the second vector will be uh, everything zero except at the ith component I have x minus a a which is just ui of x minus ai. And of course, I can split it also. And uh, so this is the relation between lambda i and ui. And I can also write it in, as the sum of three vectors, constant plus ui of x minus another constant. Okay. So why do I need this? Because lambda i is not a linear map, okay, so can, cannot apply directly, cannot say that lambda prime i of x is equal to lambda i. It's not true. But ui is linear, and these two are constant. So since ui is differentiable and its derivative is constant, then also the same thing is true for lambda i. And the derivative of lambda i at x is just ui, so it doesn't depend on x. And that's it. This is the key. <clears throat> Therefore, by the chain rule, since lambda i is differentiable and f is differentiable at a, their composition is differentiable, and the derivative is given by this formula. So when I evaluate at the point h, at, uh, or at the increment h, I just get, so the existence of the, this derivative is means that the partial derivative exists, and this formula can be written in this way. Okay, just apply h i. Okay, and we are almost done because now when I do the summation, this is true for every eight, for every i. So when I do the summation from i to n, I get this. But f prime of a is a linear operator, so I can put the sum inside. And now if you look at this term inside, sum of u i of h i is what actually? So you have the first one, u1 of h1 is just h1 0 0 0 plus 0 h2 0 0 0 plus etc. 0, 0, H, N. So this is just, as you may check easily, this is just the vector H whose components are H1, H2, H, N. So this is just F prime of H. 
Okay, so I can write this now, which uh, in as a row matrix times a vector. Okay, so this is a kind of dot product in uh, a general sense. But here, instead of multiplication, I, I have just an evaluation. So I have a row vector or a row matrix of linear bounded operators evaluated at a vector with components h1, h. So, okay, and now, so yeah, this is what I was saying. So this is a very useful notation, actually. So we put the linear bounded maps uh, into a row matrix or a vector, and it's useful to write instead of writing h as a row as uh, a row vector, we write it as a column vector. In this case, we can write f prime of h as this dot product, and the meaning should be clear: it's the partial derivative with respect to x1 evaluated at h1 plus second component evaluated at h2 plus etc. Last component evaluated at the h and that's it. so it's a very useful notation okay and now if you combine everything we uh, said so far we can study functions uh, of several variables with several components so we consider a function you defined on an open subset of a product of norm spaces and that takes values in a product of norm spaces so we have m components and n variables and here again if f is differentiable at the point A, then all the partial derivatives exist, and we can write f prime at H in this uh, matrix form. And this matrix is called the Jacobian matrix of f. And here again, we are not multiplying numbers here because we are evaluating. This is a linear operator. We evaluate it at H1, and then we add. So it's just the usual rule of uh, multiplication of a matrix by a vector but here instead of numbers we have linear operators so this linear operator at h1 plus the second one at h2 plus etc and so of course the converse is not true as we know so if the partial because the existence of the partial derivatives at a point need not do not imply even continuity action so the converse is not true okay so uh thank you for this concludes uh, this chapter and this video so thank you for attention and see you next time